This presentation is part of a curriculum developed collaboratively by the following partners through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Please feel free to share, reuse, and adapt. This presentation is called Understanding Copyright. It is the third module of our self-guided curriculum from the Public Library Partnerships Project, and I'm Frankie Abbott of the Digital Public Library of America. So before we get started talking about copyright for digitization projects, uh, I want to make a few disclaimers. The first of which is that I'm not a lawyer, and the folks who developed this curriculum collaboratively are not lawyers. We're cultural heritage professionals. So this is not official legal advice. Uh, it's instead a set of strategies that will help you determine whether or not you want to select a specific content for digitization and what kind of uh, risk you might be running or not running in doing that selecting. Uh, and second of all, we're dealing with the law, uh, which is, of course, interpretable and sometimes a little bit squishy. So unlike death and taxes, um, there are very few absolutes with copyright. So the goal for today's presentation is to understand strategies for selecting and describing content on the basis of copyright status. That's our goal. That's going to be the sort of main thrust that those strategies of the presentation. And so we're hoping that at the end of this session, you'll feel confident assessing the copyright status of an item, identifying content for digitization, and finally creating useful rights and access metadata. So what is copyright or rights when you hear people having a conversation about that? Let's start with some basics. So rights refers to uh, reproduction or publication restrictions on an item. It's copyright status according to US law. So when we talk about rights, we're talking about um, reproduction and publication. When we make a digital copy of something, this is reproduction. And when we display that copy on our own website, that is potentially an act of publication. So this is the way in which rights are relevant to the work that we're doing through a digitization project. Copyright law is really designed to balance um, two ideas primarily. The first is that folks creating uh, and sometimes publishing content, original content, should be ensured a certain degree of protection. They should be allowed to make decisions for a period of time about how to reproduce and distribute that content. So protection is sort of one side of that balance, but the other is that copyright law is designed to also say that protection has a particular term. And at the end of that term, the public should have unrestricted access to this content. And so a lot of copyright law, as you'll learn today, is about periods of time or terms. Terms of protection followed by a moment at which an item is no longer protected and becomes property of the public, usable and accessible um, by members of the American public. Copyright status is helpful uh, in a few different ways to understand this and to be able to um, make some use of it. It helps cultural heritage institutions determine whether to digitize and what level of risk digitized content might pose to their institution. Copyright status also helps users of your content determine um, whether they can use your content in various ways and what they can and cannot do with it. So it's important, as we'll mention a few times in this presentation, to share what you learn about copyright with your users as clearly and concisely as possible. So let's get into evaluating content. How many of these questions can you answer about the content you're considering digitizing? Do you know the creators? Uh, in most cases, the creators of an item are the copyright holders, although sometimes uh, it could be the publisher. Do you know when an item was created? As I mentioned, copyright is a lot about um, dates, and so having specific uh, creation date information uh, or publication date information about an item is important. Was the item ever published? You'll see there's a little star by the word published because it has a specific definition uh, in copyright law that we'll get into a little bit later. And if it was published, um, by whom was it published? Do you have external information about copyright restrictions? So do you have any kind of deed of gift or other agreement that you made with a donor that specified information about copyright at the time that you acquired the physical materials? Uh, and if not, can you contact the donor? Do you, do you have contact information for the, for the person who the materials came from to find out what, if any, copyright restrictions might apply to them? As a side note for your process, uh, if you're an institution thinking about um, doing multiple digitization projects of your content over time, it might be a smart thing 
uh, to include in your deed of gift or donor contract or other intake form when dealing with materials that are donated or collected by your institution to include a specific provision about digitization and online reuse of donated resources. This is good practice so that you don't have to hunt down people um, after they donated physical items to your institution and ask them questions about whether um, their use extends to the online environment. It gets that conversation with them up front and out of the way as part of the donation process. So as you begin your content selection process for digitization, uh, if you're new to the game, we recommend that you start by identifying content in the public domain. That you start with that, with that and then move forward to other kinds of content. So what is the public domain? When the intellectual property rights of works have expired, been forfeited or are, are inapplicable, an item is in the public domain. And there are also certain types of items that we'll discuss um, to which copyright law does not apply. And those items are also considered part of the public domain. So when content is in the public domain, um, it can be used freely without permission or attribution. What does this mean? Well, it means when you find items in your collection that are in the public domain and you digitize them, um, you're doing a public service, but it also means that when you put those items up online, they can be used by other people freely without permission or attribution. So that means, um, again, that you're doing a public good. And we, on this team, consider attribution always to be a best practice. But people aren't actually obligated to do that. And so when you digitize content that's in the public domain and put it up online, you're contributing to the public record. Um, but the same principles that allowed you to digitize the content freely in the first place also allow other people to use it. So there are five common ways that works transfer into the public domain. Uh, and we're going to go through each of these five in detail. So I'll read them off now. Uh, number one, uh, copyright has expired. We've been talking about the terms of copyright. Number two, the copyright owner um, published the work without a copyright notice. This uh, applies to a very specific period of time. Number three, the copyright owner failed to renew copyright status. This also applies to a particular period of time. Uh, way number four, the copyright owner deliberately places or dedicates a piece of content to the public domain using the Creative Commons zero dedication. So uh, from the beginning, the copyright owner essentially waives their right um, to claim copyright over an item and places it in the public domain. And situation number five, uh, copyright law does not protect this type of work. And we'll talk about the types of work that copyright law does not protect. So item number one. An item is in the public domain if copyright has expired. Items published before 1923 are considered in, in the public domain. So what does published mean? I said that I was going to give you a better uh, working definition of published according to copyright law. And here is um, a legal definition of publication, which I'll read a selection from just to give you a little flavor of copyright law. Uh, Quote, publication is the distribution of copies or phono records of a work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending. So you get a flavor of copyright law here and you can see um, the copyright law has sometimes some dated terminology um, because it's law, so it's not necessarily being updated, but that's an aside. So the distribution of copies or phono records of a work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership by rental, lease, or lending. Boiled down to its essence, what this means is that publication occurs on the date on which copies of the work are first distributed to the public. So I tend, uh, outside of copyright law, to think of published materials as books, um, journals, newspapers, things with a publisher and a specific publication process that's formal and a publication date. Um, but published according to copyright law is something more general. And the standard is that copies of the, the date on which copies of the work are first distributed to the public. So let's think through what this means if you are working at um, a cultural heritage institution looking through boxes of archival materials that you're thinking of digitizing. So again, keeping the standard of distribution to the public in your mind, um, consider the examples on this list. In the pink box, in the likely published column, we have um, some traditional print items like books that we would have already probably considered published. But we also have materials like posters, brochures, pamphlets, blank postcards. These are um, 
materials that were either distributed to a broad public or potentially, in the case of postcards, um, sold for a certain amount of money. But available to the public had a particular printing run and were widely distributed. Then on the right, you have a list of materials that potentially wouldn't meet this criteria for being published under copyright law. That might include personal correspondence, um, so letters, many photographs, um, although photographs, of course, can be published and distributed to the public, many photographs are considered unpublished, and then postcards with writing. So notice how um, blank postcards or the fronts of postcards, you might say, um, can be a published item, but when somebody has written on a postcard a personal message and you're considering digitizing the area of the postcard with the personal writing, that section of the postcard might be considered unpublished. And so uh, writing on a postcard can alter its um, status, its publication status under copyright law. For unpublished works, uh, this, the term of copyright offers the most protection. This is the sort of quintessential copyright protection story of the uh, creative artist who has unpublished manuscripts um, and they don't want others to profit from. And so unpublished works, um, particularly since recent copyright legislation in 1998, are given the longest terms of protection of any kinds of materials under copyright law. And it's important to be aware of this as we often encounter unpublished materials in our archives. So two things on this chart that are worth noting. Uh, in the top row, um, unpublished works, when you know, uh, have information about the author. The copyright term for unpublished works is the life of the author plus 70 years. So uh, as of January 1st, 2015, works from authors who died before 1945 were considered uh, in the public domain. And then last on this list, because this is often the case for us, uh, unpublished works when the death date of the author is not known or potentially um, we, we, don't, we don't know much about the author in general, let alone knowing a particular death date. The standard is 120 years from the date of creation. So that would mean for us in 2015, works created before 1895 that are unpublished would be in the public domain. Situation two, um, the copyright owner published a work without a copyright notice. So this again applies to published works, so keeping in mind the copyright's definition of published and unpublished. And this applies to a specific period of time in copyright, as I mentioned, where um, in order to claim copyright over an item, uh, a copyright owner was required to publish a copyright notice as part of the item. And this period of time is between 1923 and 1977. Um, there's also a, a component of this for those of you interested in the advanced copyright that applies to 1978 to 1988, but it's more complicated. So um, feel free to do a little research about that if you're interested. So what does a copyright notice look like? Well, I've put some examples on the bottom of this slide, um, but generally a copyright notice includes either the word copyright or the symbol for copyright that we're familiar with, um, a date, and then the name of the copyright owner. So this is the notice that you would look for on an item published between 1923 and 1977 to see if um, that item is in the public domain, which it would be without the, without the copyright notice, or under copyright if the person did include the copyright notice. So here's a shameless attempt to sexy up the copyright presentation a little bit with an, an ad um, created by Dick Whittington Studio. It's an ad for the It Bra. Um, published in 1938 and published because it's an ad. So it was um, distributed to the public and made available and the date is 1938. And hopefully as you can see, um, there's no copyright notice on this particular advertisement, which means that this ad is in the public domain. Situation three, um, the copyright owner failed to renew copyright status of a published work. This applies to works published, again, so note that we've mostly been talking about published works between 1923 and 1963. Um, copyright owners were required in order to extend their term of copyright to renew copyright status by filing official paperwork with the Copyright Office. And if they didn't do that, which many, many people didn't, um, their work has transferred into the public domain. This does require research in order to, to be able to discover that an item is in the public domain by doing um, renewal tracking. But the Copyright Office does keep track of renewals um, up to 1950. And Hatsi Trust, if you're familiar with that 
uh, organization is also researching this period of publication. So hopefully there are some good resources if you are in dogged pursuit of um, knowing about a specific item and its copyright renewal status. You can do that. Situation number four. Um, I mentioned this on the list, but the copyright owner can deliberately place or dedicate a work to the public domain using a Creative Commons zero dedication. Generally, um, this means that the copyright owner is saying at some point during their own term of copyright, I waive my copyright claim over this item and I'm going to essentially dedicate it for public use. An adorable kitten photo that you can see um, up on an, an image sharing website and this slide is probably almost unintelligible on the video but um, the arrow points to a place where the person who took this photo of this adorable kitten uh, who appears to be nestled in a towel um, has gone ahead and de <clears throat> given this a public um, domain CC0 Creative Commons license which is again really a waiver of their copyright claim over the item. They've gone ahead and said hey I'm just going to say right now that people can make whatever um, free use of this kitten in a towel photo and they don't need to attribute it to me and they don't need to ask for my permission and I'm dedicating this to sort of the public record. And then finally situation five uh, for public domain works. Uh, copyright law does not uh, protect this type of work. So documents created by the federal government and its employees as part of their jobs are not protected by copyright and they are therefore in the public domain. So unlike the other scenarios where copyright was not claimed, copyright was not renewed, uh, copyright expired, or an owner dedicated, in this situation, um, fed, uh, documents created by the federal government were in fact never given uh, copyright protection. They were always considered in the public domain. So you see this lovely um, official presidential photographer photo of um, George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush with dog. Uh, that is in the National Archives and Records Administration collection, and it is um, taken by a federal employee as part of uh, his or her job, and so it is not protected by copyright. It is in the public domain, despite the fact that it is clearly somewhat recent. Some state documents are also public domain. So, for example, in Massachusetts, the state I'm currently sitting in, uh, within the law it says records created by Massachusetts government are not copyrighted and are available for public use. Some state documents are not in the public domain, as explained um, in the law. So Arizona, for example, uh, makes a distinction between federal works and state works um, and has said that state works are not in the public domain and are protected by copyright. So if you plan on working with uh, state documents as part of your digitization project, you'll want to do research about the state that they come from uh, and the state that you're in to see what the laws are uh, around the state documents and the public domain. So we would consider the following to be best practice. Um, an institution should not claim copyright on digitized content when the original is in the public domain. Remember that we're talking about um, essentially making copies of things. And in fact, the digitization process, as you'll see uh, in later presentations in this curriculum, if you keep listening, the goal of the digitization process is to make a digital version of a physical item that is as close as possible to the original. So when we digitize something, we are indeed making a copy of it. And as such, uh, when you make a copy of something uh, that was in the public domain in its physical form, the digital item is also in the public domain. So um, only a significant um, creative and original alteration of a public domain work makes it a new work or an alteration that might be protected by copyright. And the classic example here is Mona Lisa with a mustache. So the Mona Lisa, obviously a famous painting of a certain age, um, old enough to be considered part of the public domain, and yet um, when another artist came and put a mustache on the Mona Lisa, that was considered a, sig a significant enough original and creative um, interpretation of the Mona Lisa, right? A commentary on the, Mon the Mona Lisa's uh, masculinity or cultural value. And so Mona Lisa with a mustache was considered an artistic alteration and that was able to be protected by copyright, even though it was created using a work in the public domain. So an alteration has to meet copyright laws uh, requirements for originality and creativity, like Mona Lisa with a mustache. Um, 
changing uh, some settings and doing some cleanup work and putting cop copies down on a scanner does not um, qualify as an alteration that would meet that standard. So again, important to remember, you do sometimes see people attempting to claim um, digital copyright, but best practice is an institution should not claim copyright on digitized content when the original is in the public domain. So as a recap, just to run back through, because this is a lot of um, little technical information and then we're going to practice for a minute. Public domain applies if copyright has expired, so that's published work before 1923. The copyright owner published the work without a copyright notice, so that applies to published work between 1923 and 1977. The copyright owner failed to renew copyright status. This is published work 1923 to 1963, but you have to do a little research. Uh, the copyright owner deliberately places or dedicates it to the public domain, or copyright law uh, never protected this type of work, and that's federal government and some states. So let's practice. Um, just a few scenarios that I'm going to show up here, and then I'm going to walk you through a process that I not very creatively like to call, was it published, is it in the public domain? So item number one, um, this is a 1950 elect Bonner Democrat for Governor poster. Um, lovingly digitized by the Montana Historical Society Research Center. Um, so this is a poster. Uh, so was it published is our first question that we're going to ask about an item as, as we try to fit in things into our matrix uh, of, of copyright. So was it published? Yes, it's a poster. It was put up in public places. It was therefore distributed to the public. Um, so we could consider this to be a published item. To the second question, is it in the public domain? Well, we would need um, some information Specifically, we need to know what it says on that tiny line at the bottom of the poster and whether or not that is a copyright notice. Because again, this is 1950. So we're within our 1923 to 1977 and we've determined that this is a published item. I'm going to blow that up for you and we can see that it says paid for and circulated by Bonner for Governor Club, um, JW Mayhen Treasurer, Helena, Montana. In fact, it is not a copyright notice and that means that this work is in the public domain. Example number two, uh, an 1833 letter from Sophia Hawthorne to her mother, uh, digitized by the New York Public Library. This um, is a relative of Nath the, the famous uh, writer Nathaniel Hawthorne. So 1833, letter from Sophia Hawthorne to her mother. Was it published? No. It's very clearly a piece of correspondence, and at that, a piece of personal correspondence between family members. So it is a piece of unpublished material, and therefore, subject, as you'll remember, to the longest possible terms of copyright. Is it in the public domain? Well, um, that is a piece of information that we would answer either because we know Sophia Hawthorne's death date, which if I remember correctly is sometime in the 1870s, or even if we don't, we would add 120 years to the uh, creation date of this letter, which is 1833, which would bring us to 1953, which means, yes, this letter is essentially old enough, although unpublished, and so it is in the public domain. The math works out whether, again, you take that death date, which I do happen to know, or you add the 120 years from the date of creation. Scenario number three. This is a 1920 uh, Ward Line Mexico cruise pamphlet digitized by the Smithsonian. Was it published? Yes, it is a pamphlet uh, that was circulated to the distributed to the public as an advertisement is it in the public domain so it's published and it's before 1923 so we don't even need to look for a copyright notice or anything like that because we are uh, published and before 1923 so we are good to go this item is in the public domain item number four uh, drawing by marshall davis an artist for the defense visual information center of a card game at Ramey air force base was it published well, this question is actually a little bit hard to answer, although it is a drawing. Um, and so to me, that suggests we might err on the side of unpublished. It's never really completely clear. And uh, I did not find this item in the context of a book or a situation like that. So fair to say that there's a little bit of ambiguity about whether this was published or unpublished. But is it in the public domain? Yes, um, because it is created by an artist employed by the federal government. Um, working for the Defense Visual Information Center. So it is, in fact, in the public domain. 
And finally, uh, a kind of item for an extra uh, level of difficulty that I did not talk about yet in the presentation. Item number five is a 1964 menu from the um, automated restaurant on wheels of the New York Central Railroad. So was it published? Yes, it was distributed to people uh, and, and, and in fact distributed to anybody who rode on this train uh, and had an interest in eating in the automated restaurant. So it is in fact a published item. Um, is it in the public domain? Well, it's 1964. Um, so we would be looking at the very bottom, which is probably pretty hard for you to see, uh, for a copyright notice. But rest assured that the sentences at the bottom of this item are about the uh, use of waste receptacles and their location and how their use would be greatly appreciated. So there is no copyright notice here. It's 1964, which means um, it's a menu. So it is published and distributed to the public and uh, there's no copyright notice. So it's in the public domain. So we've shared a lot of information with you in this presentation about the public domain. A lot of steps, a lot of considerations. I hope that this has been a useful introduction, but I also want to point you to um, a resource, which is the Copyright Genie, uh, available to you to walk you through the process that we just explored. So the Copyright Genie, which is both linked from the end of this presentation and easily Googleable. Um, helps you to to use the steps, some of the steps that I've just outlined to determine the copyright status of a particular item um, and is a useful tool again for kind of navigating some of these pretty specific particulars um, of determining whether an item is in the public domain or under copyright. So when an item is not in the public domain, we've just given you a whole lot of information about trying to identify content in the public domain and we have in fact recommended that that is a place that you might start, especially if you are very new to digitization. But if an item is not in the public domain, um, what are some of the options that you have for working with copyrighted works or works that you suspect are copyrighted? Well, of course, waiting is always an option. Uh, you can uh, still rely on the things that you have available to you, which we've gone over. Things published before 1923, unpublished material, um, again, that meets the criteria for the death date of the author or uh, 120 years from the creation date. Many of the items published between 1923 and 1977 are okay, but you will have to investigate copyright notices and potentially check renewal statuses. And then you can uh, just wait until more content enters the public domain, but it's worth noting um, that that may take a while. I mentioned earlier in the presentation um, the Copyright Term Extension Act uh, pioneered by Sonny Bono in 1998 that added uh, a whole lot of additional time to copyright term um, over the course of the history of copyright law in this country. In fact, copyright terms have gotten longer and longer. So there's not a, it's every year um, new content doesn't necessarily enter the public domain. In fact, the effect of the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act is to have put uh, somewhat of a freeze on content entering the public domain for a period of time. So content um, published in 1923 will enter the public domain in 2019, maybe, unless there is additional uh, Copyright Term Extension Act activity um, or, or new laws that make that more of a challenge. And so it's, it's worth considering that you could be waiting for quite a while um, for an expansion of your public domain content. So another option is to get permission. Um, if you can identify the copyright holder, uh, which is generally, again, the creator of an item or the publisher, uh, you can perform due diligence uh, and get in touch with them to ask their permission to digitize uh, their item and put a copy up online. So due diligence is not a defined concept. It sort of sounds technical, but it's in fact a general idea. Um, and this table that you see here is a sort of sample process um, of due diligence that somebody used. And you can see it follows a, a formula with certain kinds of principles. So identifying the copy holder is an important first step and then sending correspondence to that person in multiple formats, so both print letters and emails this person sent, uh, giving them a month to respond, and if not having heard from them, um, attempting to contact them again after 30 days. That's sort of a, a due diligence process for asking for permission to digitize. So contact in multiple mediums, then try again, um, and document all of the efforts that you make to get in touch with a copyright holder um, basically, you're trying to exhaust all reasonable options for locating the copyright holder 
and you're trying to document the process by which you tried to get permission from them. If there's somebody that you know, uh, you can get them to come in and uh, give you permission in writing to digitize and make available a copy of their work. So you've tried, you've documented, but you just can't find um, the author or publisher of a work. This is a very, very common scenario for cultural heritage institutions um, with correspondence, particularly with photographs. So take heart. Um, for a lot of older materials like photographs and audio recordings, it may be completely impossible to identify the copyright holder. Or if you can identify them, it may be impossible to locate them and figure out a way to correspond with them to ask their permission. These are called orphan works. Um, orphan works, again, when you can uh, not identify and or locate the copyright holder. And orphan works uh, are a situation um, that you'll want to think about from an institutional perspective. So you'll want to digitize orphan works at your institution's discretion. And it, consider your institution's risk comfort level. So the possibility with orphan works is um, that you could make a copy of something uh, not knowing who the copyright holder is and that that person could surface and say, this is my work. Um, I am the copyright holder. Consider that um, that scenario isn't always entirely terrible, meaning sometimes people are, are pleased to be reconnected with work or clean work, and so other people may want you to take the work down if they surface. Um, this is honestly um, experientially pretty unlikely <laughs> based on a survey of folks that I've spoken with in the world of digitization, but many institutions do go ahead and digitize orphan works and some don't. So you'll want to consider uh, what you want your institution's relationship to be, um, what your risk comfort level is with orphan works. This is a genius um, collage made by my coworker Amy Rudersdorf, uh, and it is a collage of pictures of orphans, and these are all also orphan works. So the photographer of all of these is unknown. But you can see that people have gone ahead and digitized them and put them up online anyway. And, you know, that digitization may or may not have done some interesting public good should one of these photographs be uh, an early life photograph of um, a particular woman who is a relative um, that is then discovered by people doing family research online. And so there, there's definitely a positive aspects to making content available um, when we can and when your institution feels comfortable. Finally, um, a third option for you is fair use, which I would definitely earmark in this discussion as um, the most complicated and um, squishy of the options available to you. So what is fair use? Well, fair use is not law. Um, fair use is a set of uh, exceptions to copyright law. And it's, as you can see here, and I'll go through this briefly, uh, it's a set of guidelines that essentially get tested in court um, where its boundaries are drawn on kind of a case by case basis with implications for other institutions. So um, should you decide that you think that you have or qualify for a fair use exception, you'll want in your own mind um, to feel like you have a clear understanding of how you might qualify and how the way in which you qualify uh, measures against the way that fair use has been um, decided on by courts. So in the left-hand column, you see uh, what are considered fair use factors. And again, there's no magic formula for determining whether a use is a fair use or not. These are just factors that the court considers. Um, and as you'll see when we go through some sample cases in a second, there isn't, you don't need to qualify on a certain number of these factors. You um, have in your own mind a justification for fair use. Uh, and ultimately, uh, courts again sort of decide uh, when these factors become part of the equation. So um, just to go through them really quickly, we've sort of <laughs> boiled them down. Um, one of the factors that, that, the, that a court would consider would be the purpose of the use. So um, on the more positive side for, for a f making a fair use argument would be that the purpose of the use of an item, and use in this case for you would mean digitization and display, was nonprofit or transformative um, versus commercial or duplication. So the court favors use, again, that is nonprofit or transformative. The nature of the, of the item itself, the nature of the work, um, are you... Um, making a copy of something that is factual or 
are you making a, a copy of something, a fair use of something that is creative? Again, remember I said earlier that uh, copyright law in general, of course, favors creative original works. You can think here of that old edict, you can't copyright the phone book, right? So factual things don't get as much protection in general under copyright law as creative work. Um, the amount of use that you're making is the third factor. So are you uh, trying to use a, a small amount of the original work relative to the size of the original? Or are you trying to make use of a complete work um, or sort of harder or, or core of the work? And then at the impact of the use that you're making on the market for the original. Um, so again, a more favorable fair use factor would be a use that doesn't hurt the market value or, or potential financial compensation for the original. Um, more negative from a fair use standpoint would be um, a use that hurts the market uh, or a potential market that hasn't been tapped yet for the item. There's a lot to know about fair use, um, and I want to highly recommend Stanford University's resources on fair use and cases. They have really good explanations of how fair use and how it has um, been tested and determined in court and what the implications might be for your institution. So I want to recommend that you, if you're interested in fair use, follow up there. But I'm going to talk through um, two cases just really quickly by way of trying to show how these factors um, transfer into particular court decisions. So fair use. Case number one, uh, determined in 2002, a photographer named Leslie Kelly sued an image search engine, uh, Arebasoft, over use of her thumbnail images and lost. So this image search engine was using Leslie Kelly's thumbnails uh, as a way of uh, advertising their product. And the court considered this um, particular suit and decided in favor of Arebasoft that this was in fact fair use. And this is how the sort of factors in this case that we looked at on the previous slide played out. So the court ruling considered um, the purpose of the use. Uh, yes, it was commercial because this image search engine was selling something, but transformative because of the use of thumbnail images, right? Uh, that the work was in fact creative. So remember that was in our sort of no column, but that didn't mean that this fair use um, case wasn't ruled in favor of Arebasoft. Probably most important in this particular example, um, the amount of use was thumbnails only. So the thumbnail was a very small fraction of the full size images um, that Leslie Kelly depended on for livelihood, income, etc. And then relatedly, uh, because Arubisoft was using thumbnail images, um, there was very little market effect on Leslie Kelly's ability to make money um, off of photography. You may have heard of this particular case, uh, but fair use uh, number two, the Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust. Uh, you, you may well be aware of the Google Books digitization project where libraries provided Google um, with books to scan. And the court ruled that this uh, was fair use um, because the digital scans provided by Google were used um, by the libraries for three purposes, preservation of the books, to enable patrons to do full text uh, searching, and also to allow the libraries to provide electronic access for disabled patrons who couldn't read the print versions. So again, thinking about those fair use factors, um, what was important in this case? Well, um, these three purposes that I just mentioned to which the scans were actually used were transformative. So instead of offering, to making the scans to offer free versions of books um, that authors might have been making money off of. Um, the uses instead were transformative towards different purposes than the original was intended. The court also did not find any evidence of financial harm. Um, and so in this case, again, having done the scanning in and of itself wasn't actually doing anything to affect the market value um, for the books. That was the ruling of the court. Again, more about fair use at Stanford's uh, website, which is fairuse.stanford.edu. So as a recap, once you um, are working with works that you think are potentially under copyright or you can determine are under copyright, you can uh, wait until the item is clearly in the public domain. You can attempt to get permission, um, but also remember Orphan Works if the permissions process uh, becomes a challenge because you can't identify the copyright owner or locate them. And number three, uh, consider your fair use options, um, depending again on your institution and your institution's uh, interest and in risk. 
So let's talk about risk. That's a really important, I think, underlying thing that makes people nervous about the copyright conversation. And let's talk about risk as assessment because it's important for an institution to um, have an identified risk comfort level and sort of work from there. So some institutions <clears throat> are very risk averse. They don't want to do anything um, that seems like it might get them any interactions with copyright holders. Uh, and other institutions are less cautious. Um, and so it's important to understand what your institution's risk comfort level is and work from there. Um, in a survey of my coworkers, I think almost none of them uh, have worked in institutions that have received any kind of problem with either approach. So again, in a, in a range of folks who've worked at both risk averse institutions and other institutions, um, in fact, there's been very little um, feedback from digitization. So what could possibly happen? Well, um, consider that you, you know, incorrectly identified something in the public domain but it really was under copyright, or again, that you digitized an orphan work and then a copyright holder um, came out of the woodwork. So this is what could actually happen. This is the real kind of risk that you were running. You might receive a takedown notice. So the law says that the copyright owner has to provide an official notice to the host that houses the infringing material. So you would actually receive an official notice. And when you receive that official notice, you have to, are required to act, quote, expeditiously to remove or disable access to the allegedly infringing material. So that basically means if you receive an official notice from a copyright owner um, telling you that you're required to stop uh, sharing this copy that you've made of their material, you're required to take it down. This um, is not the most, this sort of dire consequence that you've probably been led to believe will happen if you uh, put something up online and a copyright owner doesn't want it up there. You will be given a notice and then you will remove that stuff um, from your site online. You may also receive takedown requests and you should consider the legitimacy of this request um, and then either take down the offending item or don't. So what's the difference between a request and a notice? Well, um, notices are uh, official and requests um, may or may not have a legal basis. So. I think of the quintessential story um, here as the person in the digitized yearbook who does not want their yearbook photo up online and then writes a request asking institution to take their yearbook down. Please don't put that picture of me in high school up on the internet. I look funny. I don't like it. Uh, now, that person, and I can personally sympathize with this, may not want their photo up in the yearbook online, but having digitized that yearbook um, doesn't make that person in the photograph, the copyright owner, and therefore doesn't make it illegal. So again, um, you may be on the receiving end of some requests that are requests from people who don't like material you've put up online, but that doesn't give them a legal basis for giving you an official notice to take it down. For some perspective on this, I mentioned um, HathiTrust earlier, if you're not familiar with them. We asked them some questions about this, uh, and in uh, their existence, since they started their digitization project, they have received um, 10 or fewer takedown notices. New York Public Library um, gets an average of about 10 uh, takedown notices or requests a year, but many of them are uh, invalid. They don't actually have a legal basis, and so NYPL doesn't necessarily take the materials down. These are institutions that are big. They have a very high risk tolerance, and um, you'll notice that really considering that the chances are pretty small that you will probably ever get a takedown notice, particularly if you are approaching content selection wisely from a rights point of view. Uh, and of course, also if you choose to not take on a great deal of risk um, when you decide what to digitize. So our advice is uh, when appropriate, try to push the envelope, let common sense prevail, um, but consider posting orphan works. Um, orphan works are a big issue. This will be a situation that applies to a lot of um, the items that you potentially come across in your own collections. And if we're not looking out for the needs of researchers, that's an important role as well. So again, if we can't find um, useful copyright information, it can be uh, in the best interests of folks to put that content up online and give people access to it. But that's a decision your institution will have to make. Uh, related to uh, copyright, think through likely sources of pushback. Um, so content related to public figures, produced by famous people, should you have a trove of this sitting around in your archives. Um, it's important to think essentially about the politics of 
digitizing content for folks who have a very active estate or a big legal team. Um, there may be some more hoops to jump through there, some people to be in touch with. You may also just not be up for um, the kind of surveillance that you might get if you digitize content related to public figures, even if you have the legal right to do so. Um, there may be challenges there. So it would be good if you have uh, stuff related to famous people to think carefully about that. It's also useful to think about the fact that there are privacy issues that are important that are different from legal issues. So for example, if you're working at a institution in a very local place uh, and you have content related to a family in your town, um, that correspondence that contains personal information about things that went on in that family, you may decide um, that you don't want to digitize that and put it up online, even though you may, you know, it may be old enough and you may legally have the right to do that because there are privacy issues for that family. Um, so again, there, there are some considerations to think through that are not just the, leg the legality of the copyright status of an item. So where are we in the rights process in the terms of this conversation so far? Well, uh, during the rights process, you determine the right status of a work and then you digitize it if your institution feels comfortable with the likely very small amount of risk that it poses. Um, and then after you digitize it, you want to clearly and concisely state in the metadata what you know of the copyright status and whether and how that item can be used, which is what we're going to talk about for the remainder of the presentation. So for a second, I'm going to ask you to put on your hat not as a potential digitizer of content, but as a user of the internet um, to think about the information we communicate to users about items that are digitized and put online. So in this activity, we're just going to look at a few examples um, considering the question, can you use the following images on your website? So here is the first uh, item. It is, uh, I think, a drawing related to theater productions. Um, Lucio, Romeo and Juliet, digitized by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And really, we're interested in the right statement for this, because we want to know if we can uh, put up this image on our website. So in the right statement, uh, you can see that there is an institution listed, although that institution is also listed in other places uh, in this record. And then uh, a con some contact information. So for questions regarding these materials, please contact the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. And then there is uh, a website that you can go to for that contact. Now. This information is not uh, totally useless to us, right? Because it does say this is the place that you would go to find out the answer to your question, but it's not very direct, right? In fact, in this rights field, we should be able to understand whether or not this item is under copyright um, and, and therefore, as users, whether we are or are not allowed to use it in various ways. Um, so the contact information is creating a, a middleman. It's creating a second step for somebody who uncovers this particular item in a place like DPLA or on UIUC's website um, to have to contact people. And if you work at a cultural heritage institution, you know that permissions creates a goodly deal of work. Uh, so it would be in everyone's best interest probably to communicate in a more direct way um, about the state of things so that every single person who isn't coming to this item is, is not necessarily trying to contact somebody. And also, of course, we know there are some people who will probably never follow this contact path and will just go ahead and use the item or not if this seems challenging. Item number two, um, letter from Sinclair Lewis to Marcella Powers, January 5th, 1942. Um, this is digitized by the St. Cl Cloud State University Archives. Um, and you can see in the rights field at the very bottom that the rights field says copyright 2009 J.P. Morgan Chase administrator de bonus non estate of Sinclair Lewis. This image may not be reproduced for any reason without the express written consent of the estate of Sinclair Lewis. Please contact the St. Cloud State University Archives for further information. So uh, in this rights field uh, there are from a communicating rights point of view, some positive things going on. Uh, the first is that we are very clearly told that this item is in fact under copyright, which makes some sense um, considering the date on the item and the fact that it is correspondence and unpublished based on what we learned earlier. Um, and we also learned, which is an interesting factoid, that J.P. Morgan Chase uh, are administrators of the estate of Sinclair Lewis, which I was personally not aware of. Um, so in that first sentence, we learn the, the explicit copyright status of this item. This item is under copyright. And in the second sentence, 
Um, this image may not be reproduced for any reason without the express written consent of the estate of Sinclair Lewis. It may not be the answer we were hoping for, but we are also told, um, and this is, this is an example of an access statement, that we can't do anything with this image, in fact. We can't make a copy of it. We cannot silkscreen it on boxer shorts and sell them. Um, we can't do any of that stuff uh, with this particular item. Lest you be um, too upset uh, by that restricted access, I want to remind you that St. Cloud State University Archives um, negotiated with the estate of Sinclair Lewis the ability to make one scanned copy and put it up online, which is of tremendous research benefit to us. So there is a copy online. We can go read this letter, therefore this letter can be incorporated into a variety of research projects, but what we aren't allowed to do with it is make additional copies of it and distribute them elsewhere without getting permission from the estate of Sinclair Lewis. So this right statement pretty clearly um, says this is under copyright and you can't do anything with it, but it says that up front and you don't need to contact the St. Cloud State University archives in order to learn that information as you did in the first item. Item number three, this is a self-portrait of the photographer Leslie Jones, um, who was an active photojournalist in the Boston area and really all over the country. Um, looking at the rights field for this particular item, um, you can see that Leslie Jones's estate in this case does uh, still own the copyright to this image, but in the first sentence, it says copyright Leslie Jones, but then the second sentence is a Creative Commons license that tells us what we can and can't do with the item, so we don't have to contact anyone to know. So this particular Creative Commons license says, uh, this work is licensed for use under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, CCBYNCND. We're going to talk in more detail about Creative Commons licenses, but those terms um, just to break them down in the case of this particular item mean if we uh, decide to that we do have some use opportunities with this particular item um, and if we decide to use it elsewhere we have to attribute it to Leslie Jones we have to give him credit for having taken the photograph of himself we cannot use it for commercial purposes and we can't make derivatives so we can't make new versions we can't make Leslie Jones's self-portrait into a, a meme by stamping words over his face right according to the way that this is licensed but we are permitted some use of it even though it's under copyright which is the important part about CC licenses that we'll talk about later so you saw in the last two items that I showed uh, a good formula for best practice which is that they each um, of the Sinclair Lewis and Leslie Jones items included a right statement and an access statement. Right statements communicate the legal status of an item, so whether it is or is not under copyright, whether it's in the public domain, whether it's under copyright. Access statements, uh, like Creative Commons licenses or the statement you saw in the Sinclair Lewis item, communicate how to responsibly use an item, so they tell you what you can and cannot do with an item. Again, we consider it best practice to include access statements with right statements. Um, your users, if you do this, will be able to understand what they can do with content on and offline. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, Creative Commons licenses. And Creative Commons licenses, um, if you are interested in learning more, I, the website is up here, creativecommons.org, um, works within copyright law to protect works, but also provide some access to content that might otherwise be inaccessible. So you'll see Creative Commons licenses only with copyrighted materials. Um, and a Creative Commons license, as you saw in the Leslie Jones example, is an opportunity for the owners of works under copyright to permit certain kinds of uses of that copyrighted content and exclude other uses. CC uh, licenses help the creators retain copyright while allowing others to make some use, as I said. They also uh, all uh, generally include uh, attribution as a requirement, so they ensure that the, the creators of particular work are getting the credit that they deserve for having made their work. Creative Commons licenses work around the world, so they're designed to work within um, various different legal systems in different countries uh, about copyright. And the Creative Commons licenses last as long as applicable copyright lasts. So, as I said, something uh, has to be in copyright to have a Creative Commons license. And when the copyright for an item expires, so does the Creative Commons license um, because the item enters the public domain. And then there are no restrictions on use. Uh, so that should hopefully make sense based on what you have learned about copyright. 
some copyright terms um, to break down in the lingo of uh, Creative Commons. Uh, CC, of course, stands for Creative Commons. That's probably totally obvious to you by now. Um, BY, as in, you know, by Frankie Abbott, is uh, the sign for attribution. That means that you have to attribute the creative work to the copyright holder. You have to give them credit. SA means share alike. This means that if you make a derivative work or adaptation of an item, again, that, that meme over Leslie Jones's self-portrait um, or, you know, the, the silk screening, you, it has to be licensed in the same way as the original. So if you make a derivative work, it has to be licensed in the same way. NC stands for non-commercial, which means um, that you're not allowed to use something in a commercial context. And ND means no derivatives. We talked about that one already a little bit, but that means um, that the copyright owner has said that you can't make derivatives of a work. Finally, uh, CC0, which we've already talked about, um, you wouldn't use this in a rights field because if somebody had w used CC0 to waive their copyright, we would just be listing something as in the public domain in the copyright state, um, in the rights field. But you'll notice one thing to just point out uh, is that you will never in a CC license see SA and ND in the same license, and that's because you can either make derivatives, but you have to share them um, using the same license, or you can't make derivatives at all, right? So those are mutually exclusive situations. Here is a screenshot of the licenses uh, from the most open to the least open. So the most open up top is uh, CC BY license, which basically uh, says, although this is under copyright, um, that it can be used, you can make derivatives, um, you can use it in commercial contexts, all if you attribute the work to the original um, copyright holder. So that's CC BY and it's the most open. Uh, and then in the bottom right corner, you see the least open, which is the um, particular Creative Commons license that we saw on the Leslie Jones item, uh, which requires attribution, says that you cannot use commercially, says you cannot make derivatives. So consider though, that even though this is the least open of the Creative Commons licenses, it still provides a tremendous amount of, um, of use, tremendous amount of use, particularly when we think about this as a piece of copyrighted material being used in a variety of research contexts that are not commercial. Um, the fact that Boston Public Library and Leslie Jones's estate negotiated the use of the CC license on this particular item and other Leslie Jones photographs has really opened them up for all kinds of use that they would not have been um, put to before, and that's a valuable thing. So the CC licenses, again, have these um, on the site full descriptions, which are useful, that, that give a pretty good explanation. Again, should you find yourself sitting with uh, a copyright owner in a position to negotiate a particular CC license, again, remember that you would have to be making that agreement with the copyright owner. CC licenses are not the kind of thing that you're going to be um, stamping on content willy-nilly. They're an agreement that the copyright owner is supposed to sign off on because they're related to copyright. They're part of that process in general. So there are useful um, full descriptions of what these particular CC licenses mean on the Creative Commons website for that same license, which in this case we're looking at CC by SA. Um, there are also, I would say, uh, more uh, briefer explanations that are also human readable um, as well as machine readable licenses. A few examples from the DPLA. Um, you can see this particular item uh, is still under copyright. So you can see that in that first rights statement. Uh, and then in the second uh, sentence is the access statement, which is a CC license. In this case, CC uh, BY and CSA attribution non commercial share alike. So if we were to make a derivative of this particular map, we stamped words on it, we cut a piece of it off and used it somewhere else, we would be obligated to also license that derivative as CC, BY, and CSA. Um, finally, a WSB program log, uh, again, under copyright to the Cox Broadcasting Company, but um, usefully uh, has a right statement in that first sentence that says copyright, but the access statement um, says that this is licensed under Creative Commons, it's Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license like the Leslie Jones photograph. This one we can't make derivatives of, but we can use um, if we attribute and use it in non-commercial contexts. So what does a good rights field look like? Um, well, I wanted to finish by showing just a couple of examples. There's a little bit of repetition here. Um, for our items in the public domain, um, it's useful to state in a rights field in the metadata that the item is in the public domain. And then I like this particular example because 
it's almost as if it has an access statement for people who did not sit through a fabulous presentation about copyright like you did and um, don't necessarily understand what the language of public domain means. So this statement says this item is in the public domain and as such may be freely used without restriction. So it's giving a definition of the public domain and a comment about use and access at the end of the sentence. That's a great thing to put in your rights field um, if you're dealing with items in the public domain. For items under copyright, we recommend, if possible, that you uh, try to work with copyright holders to agree on a CC license. But again, uh, if you're dealing with copyrighted works, it's important to have a rights uh, statement in which you say that the item is under copyright and an access statement, ideally, again, a Creative Commons license or something else that gives um, users a sense of what they may or may not be able to do with the work if the copyright holder is permitting any kinds of use. We at the DPLA, uh, like Creative Commons uh, and other standardized rights projects, because they have the potential, uh, if we could get rights language in metadata standardized, to give users of massive digital collections or aggregation projects like the Digital Public Library of America the right to um, filter search results by rights and access statements. Um, you can already do this to some extent uh, on Google Images. So if you, like me, are often in the position where you're looking for uh, images, for example, to illustrate a presentation and you're only interested in the items that you would be able to use freely, um, it would be useful to be able to filter those items out in a search. And to be able to do that, rights fields cannot have contact information for individual institutions. They have to have uh, standardized language that, that kills two birds with one stone. That standardized language communicates more effectively to users up front what they can and cannot do with content and what kind of copyright status it has. But number two, behind the scenes, they also allow us to set up um, this example from Europeana, which is a system of facets where people can say, I want to see all the things that are CC BY, and we can allow them that filtering capability, but only through standardization of right statements. So you may be asking yourself about uh, what one should put in the rights field for, say, orphan works, or um, what you should put in the rights field if you're considering uh, fair use or think that you are, are digitize something for specifically an educational purpose, for example. The DPLA has been doing a lot of work on this front um, in a project with Europeana uh, with assistance from Creative Commons called Getting It Right on Rights, uh, where the DPLA and Europeana are teaming up to propose a set of standardized rights statements. So be on the lookout for that project. It should give some pretty explicit recommendations about good rights and access um, statements that you can put that will be clear to users and be operating as part of a standard in your rights metadata field. Uh, and that'll be coming out in January 2016. So again, keep rightstatements.org in mind um, and check back there in January for additional ideas about standardized language that you might put in your rights fields. And of course, for additional information about metadata in general, because this has only been a very brief piece about rights metadata at the end of this presentation, um, enjoy the using metadata presentation given by Greer Martin and Anna Neutrauer in the fourth module of this curriculum. Finally, um, this is a list of resources. There is lots to learn about copyright, um, the public domain, copyright materials, uh, and orphan works and fair use. So we recommend that you do reading if you're interested in the subject. Um, we hope you've given you the confidence to get started in this presentation and thanks so much for joining us.